Hi, and welcome to Season 2, Episode 2 of the Literary or the Lit Minute with me, Professor Stephanie Johnson, also known as The Right, W-R-I-T-E, Professor. This episode is entitled Black History is Lit because, well, it is. It's been an epic month from recalling and recognizing the various achievements of Blacks in America and in the African diaspora, the global diaspora. Man, we've been having such a great time this month. The latest achievement exemplified in the release of Black Panther, a superhero film for our community not you know to forget the superheroes that existed before but this one feels just a little different and nowadays the rallying cry is Wakanda forever and you know we're talking so much about the African diaspora and how Africans within a global diaspora relate and interact with one another well it's sparking such a great discourse among us around the world and there has to be something great that comes out of that but lest we forget to remember we must recall that that conversation started centuries ago with uh, Marcus Garvey and possibly even before that so we're just falling in line we're staying in tune with the conversations and the discourses that took place in early American history as Africans uh, had this new experience in the new world and were trying to determine how they were going to navigate that new world before this episode I'm gonna go back even farther I want to talk about Frederick Douglass. Now, Frederick Douglass was actually a mulatto or African American statesman born in February of 1818 in Talbot County, Maryland. He was enslaved for approximately 20 years during his life and in becoming free, he realized the importance, and even before he became free, he realized the importance of literacy. And in actuality, he was one of the major inspirations of why I have embarked upon this particular project, The Literary Minute, to inflame and spark a passion for reading. And again, not just for reading anything, but primarily for reading articles and books and publications and literature that pertain to African-American culture, life, and history. Now, I've chosen this topic because it is a passion of mine. And what I encourage others to do is find your passion and read anything that you can get your hands on regarding your passion. But don't just read it study it, critically read it, actively read it, and then enter into the larger conversation regarding that subject and fit it into the puzzle of our entire existence. That's much needed to not only just state your place in the world and in the consciousness of this world, but to come to a level of understanding that is needed in order to navigate the life that you have and the path that you will have in this world. Reportedly, Frederick Douglass was the most photographed American during the 19th century. And that's no surprise because he was an effective abolitionist, author, and statesman, as well as social change agent. Now, he wrote several autobiographies, the first of which was Narrative of the Life of Frederick Douglass, an American Slave. And within that text, his basic argument showed that he himself was living proof that enslaved Africans were, you know, against popular opinion. They were not only human, but also intellectually capable to stand toe to toe against um, the inhumane and degrading institution of slavery and uh, its seceding political and social dynamics. Regarding that text, author David W. Blight stated this, Narrative of the life of Frederick Douglass, an American slave, is a great story about the meaning of slavery and freedom in antebellum America. The most artistically crafted and widely read of all the American slave narratives, Douglass's first of three autobiographies is at once a work of imaginative literature, abolitionist argument, and historical analysis. Frederick Douglass had many quotes regarding slavery and freedom and the importance of literacy to gaining one's independence. And here's one of them. Once you learn to read, you will be forever free. 
Frederick Douglass, as he, you know, got along into his maturity and, and into adulthood, he realized that the main reason that slave masters and mistresses and slaveholders and overseers denied enslaved Africans education and literacy was because once they had the information to read and write on their own, of course they were going to seek their freedom. They were already analytically mined people with critical thinking skills and creativity, of course, because our history did not start in enslaved institutions. Our history started on a completely different continent that was rich with its own history, with its own identity, with its own civilizations and advancements, and so rich that those civilizations impacted other great civilizations impacted them so much that they felt like they had to steal a lot of the technological advances and ingenuity and inventions and inventiveness that we exhibited so early in world history. See, that's why literacy and education were denied to the enslaved African. Many enslaved Africans during the abolitionist movements who had an opportunity to write their autobiographies, they basically said the same thing about this particular aspect of enslavement, the denial of education and the denial of literacy. So therefore, back then, even become literate was an act of rebellion. This was a strategy of the social and political uh, ideas of that time, and not everybody agreed. You know, no racial group or no ethnicity is monolithic, so there were some who reached out to provide enslaved Africans with a measure of literacy, possibly even to make their own work, <laughs> you know, and, and the service of the Africans um, easier to them. You know, there that's the caveat as well. But whatever their motive was, there were some who reached out to provide literacy for the enslaved Africans. And in chapter six of this narrative, Frederick Douglass shared this. Very soon after I went to live with Mr. and Mrs. Ald, she very kindly commenced to teach me the A, B, C. After I had learned this, she assisted me in learning to spell words of three or four letters. Just at this point of my progress, Mr. Ald found out what was going on and at once forbade Mrs. Ald to instruct me further, telling her, among other things, that it was unlawful as well as unsafe to teach a slave to read. To use his own words further, he said, quote, if you give a nigger an inch, he will take an L. A nigger should know nothing but to obey his master, to do as he is told to do. Learning would spoil the best nigger in the world now, he said. He said further, if you teach that nigger, speaking of myself, how to read, there would be no keeping him. It would forever unfit him to be a slave. He would at once become unmanageable and of no value to his master. As to himself, it would do him no good, but a great deal of harm. It would make him discontented or unhappy. These words sank deep into my heart, stirred up sentiments within that lay slumbering and called into existence an entirely new train of thought. It was a new and special revelation explaining dark and mysterious things with which my youthful understanding had struggled, but struggled in vain. I now understood what had been to me a most perplexing difficulty, to wit, the white man's power to enslave the black man. It was a grand achievement, and I prized it highly. From that moment, I understood the pathway from slavery to freedom. It was just what I wanted and I got it at a time when I had least expected it. Whilst I was saddened by the thought of losing the aid of my kind mistress, I was gladdened by the invaluable instruction which, by the merest accident, I had gained from my master. 
<laughs> Though conscious of the difficulty of learning without a teacher, I set out with hope and a fixed purpose at whatever cost of trouble to learn how to read. The very decided manner with which he spoke and strove to impress his wife with the evil consequences of giving me instruction served to convince me that he was deeply sensible of the truths he was uttering. It gave me the best assurance that I might rely with the utmost confidence on the results which, he said, would flow from teaching me to read. What he most dreaded, that I most desired. What he most loved, that I most hated. That which to him was a great evil. To be carefully shunned was to me a great good. To be diligently sought. And the argument which he so warmly urged against my learning to read only served to inspire me with a desire and determination to learn. In learning to read, I owe almost as much to the bitter opposition of my master as to the kindly aid of my mistress. I acknowledge the benefits of both. How's that for listening and flipping the script? Shout out to South Florida and DJ Khaled, who would probably say at this point, one of the major keys, they don't want you to read. So you know what you got to do? You got to read. Surely, black history is lit because early in American history, enslaved Africans knew they came to the realization, the importance of literacy to their freedom. This has been season two, episode two of the Literary or the Lit Minute with me, Professor Stephanie Johnson, also known as the Wright, W-R-I-T-E, Professor. Remember, reading is lit, so be lit. Hi there, are you enjoying my videos? Do you find them engaging, enriching, and mildly entertaining? If so, share me, don't keep me all to yourself. I'd love to be able to share this knowledge with not only you, but with your family and your friends. So come along with me and invite others to join us as we stay lit together. Like, share my videos, and subscribe to my YouTube page. I'll be seeing you.